Hello, and welcome to another Kickstarter Creator Hangouts. Um, this is where we chat with creators about their projects and their process. I'm Zach Dunham. I'm a campaign strategist here at Kickstarter on the design and technology team where I coach people to uh, prepare for launch. So today we're going to be speaking with Yelena, Yelena and Serge, um, the creators behind Hibikozo. Um, they're back on Kickstarter for the third time now with a project to support an upcoming installation at Burning Man. Hibikozo are these beautiful geometric sculptures and they take cues from math, science, technology, and the arts. Um, just as a reminder, if you're joining us, you can drop a question here into the Hangouts or you can tweet to us at Kickstarter Tips. Um, Yelena and Serge, welcome to this edition of Kickstarter Creator Hangouts. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. And thank you for providing a wonderful platform for us to, to make our art happen. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I wanted to start out just to cover some basics. And um, can you fill everyone in who isn't familiar with Hibi Kozo, kind of how this all started and you know where the name comes from? Sure. So um, Hibi Kozo stands for the Hyperspace Bypass Construction Zone. Um, which is a nod to our favorite book, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, so Serge and I had been going to Burning Man for a really long time, and we kind of felt like we had to contribute and give back to the community. Um, and so we, we started thinking about like how we would want to participate. And so we, we both wanted to create large-scale sculptures, like definitely something that we were both very, very interested in. Um, and then it just so happened that Serge's work got a laser cutter. We started going in there at night and like prototyping and creating and playing. And they might see this. <laughs> <laughs> and they Sorry, might Brad. Cut. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, you're getting the real true life story now. Um, um, anyways, and so we, we started prototyping um, this laser cut art form. We both started to get super into learning about or relearning really about geometry and polyhedrons and kind of the connections between um, uh, patterns in 3D space as well as patterns in 2D space. And it just, the, the linkages between the two kind of subjects began, began to be very, very interesting to us. Um, There's also a TED talk that we watched that kind of opened the gates up to understanding that like you could represent um, the physical world in a way that would be very beautiful to us um, or to humans in general. So that was that was kind of the, the inspiration for the project. And some of your work is behind you, we can see um, on the couch behind you. Um, take, us, um, take us through some of the projects. What's, so you have your third project that's currently live on Kickstarter. What's, what's new with, with, with the third project? So uh, the, new, the main difference this year is we're kind of uh, transitioning our medium a little bit. Um, the first two projects relied heavily on laser cut patterns um, and basically everything was gold and everything cast shadows and was light and we sort of like honed, really honed that in. This year we've sort of taken a step back and we're actually exploring a lot of new materials. Uh, for instance, we're using mirror a lot on one of the sculptures. The other sculpture uses this uh, dichroic film, which is really fascinating. And I have a little picture of it here. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's like magic. It's actually, um, it was created when they were researching butterfly wings, right? So they tried to create a material. So we actually ha have gathered access to a large amount of this. So one of the sculptures is actually going to be that. And the great thing about that is you can like layer it against each other and it becomes almost like an infinity mirror. Mm -hmm. So when you're inside the sculpture looking up, you're basically going to be inside of a kaleidoscope, which is really fascinating. And then the third sculpture, the largest one, which we're calling Heart of Gold, um, is we're going to be using like a really thin mesh. Mm -hmm. So we almost want it to appear transparent. Um, so basically it's very much less, less gold as possible and we're really just taking our practice to another dimension. Gotcha. And um, so I unfortunately have, have never been to Burning Man. For, for those people that, that haven't had this experience, like how many people will pass through the sculptures um, over the, their lifetime at Burning Man? Yeah, so that's something that we actually always um, try to tell people about is that um, Burning Man is the only place that you can go that is a beautiful setting for installation art and just put up art. Like no nowhere else in the world can you just like go and put up a huge sculpture that um, we estimate that probably like at least like 
half, maybe more than half of the people see it. So right now, 30, it's probably 000. like thirty to forty thousand people will see it. Yeah, and it also depends where you where you place your sculpture because Burning Man's so big. You know, if you want to be right in the center of downtown where everyone sees it, basically everyone, you know, well, basically sixty thousand people will see it. We like to place our sculptures a little a little in the outskirts. Yeah, uh, kind of where there's a little more space for them to breathe. There's less competition with light and sound and whatnot because we want to kind of be a sanctuary. Yeah. So that number is reduced. But I think the people who go there, those experiences are a lot more powerful than right. someone who just happens to be like driving by on their bike and like quickly look at it and keep on going. Totally. You, you, before we were setting up, you, sh um, you had shown me this picture that you had of oh, yeah. Kubikozo in the desert. I thought that was. Do the yeah. So this photo. Yeah. This is the sculpture that we funded last, last year. year. Um, it's called Deep Thought, which was after the supercomputer in um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that gives you the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Um, and it was 15 feet tall. It had um, 60 sides. Wow. Um, and we might have the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest, world's largest triambic icosahedron. We still have to check. <laughs> um, and then this is another photo. So that's the sculpture in the center. Um, and then the three three of the sculptures were the project that we funded the first year, uh -huh. um, and then last year we added the big one, and then one and one more at seven feet. Wow, wow, that's so so cool. Um, and I, I forgot to say, like, um, congrats! You just hit your goal uh, last night on the the newest project. Yes, we are so so gra grateful for everyone who contributed to us. Yeah. It was, it, it's it's always like a um, uh, you know, you, it's when you doubt yourself the most, right? It's when you're like, ah, are people actually going to do this? Like every single time, even though we've done it before, there's still such a like feeling of gratitude um, when it actually happens. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, something that I was thinking about with um, the projects that you've run on Kickstarter. You know, um, there's, there's a challenge when part of the focus is about, you know, creating, um, in, in your case, installation work that will be at an event where not everyone might have access to it. So like, I would love to hear you, you guys talk a bit about this. Like, what are the challenges that you have when you're kind of framing a campaign um, you know, in this way? So uh, there's, I think, two elements that we, we like to include is that we want to make our rewards really special. So even if you're not going to Burning Man, the rewards themselves are very valuable. They see us as artists and that they're actually purchasing or acquiring pieces of art. You know, whether you go to Burning Man or not, that's still something that's very important to us. And the second thing is, and, and the last year was very evident of that, is that is civic installations outside of Burning Man are all part of this project. So we always say we're going to debut the sculpture at Burning Man, but we have plans for it to be exhibited in San Francisco and California, all throughout the country. Our last sculpture from last year we took to Australia, we've taken to Dubai, we've exhibited in L LA. So this is not just going up to Burning Man and getting burnt to the ground or going up to Burning Man and getting thrown in a, in a, in a, in a warehouse somewhere. Yeah. Um, this is a project that's going to live on for many, many years. Burning Man is just the best spot for us to debut something wow. uh, because the, it's the best sculpture gallery in the world, in, in our opinion. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I was poking around your website last night and saw there's the Hippie Kozo website and then there's the Kozo website where people can, as you say, you know, um, purchase some of these pieces in a, in a smaller form. Yeah, we actually mentioned that on our very first Kickstarter is that not only are you funding a sculpture, but we would love to turn this into a you know, design housewares art company. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we focus so much on the rewards, and, and it, it actually it came true. Um, we're actually yeah. using this sort of symbiosis of retail and art to go back and forth. Um, and that's, you know, I think one day we might do a Kickstarter strictly for some new products. That's awesome. We love to hear those stories. Yeah. Um, anyone who's just joining us, I just want to remind them, uh, we're talking with Yelena and Serge from Hippie today, and if you have a question for them, you can drop it into the Hangouts here. Um, or tweet to us at Kickstarter Tips. Um, what about what about the process of making these things? Um, you know, there's an extensive amount of laser cutting that goes into this. I would love to hear, yeah, a bit about the work behind the scenes that, that y'all are doing. 
Yeah, so actually the way that we came up with the, you know, miniature version of the sculptures um, as a reward is that we were just making prototypes and we put a light in it to see what it would look like and we're like, oh, this is a lamp as well. <laughs> um, so that process was like, light bulb went off, you know, like literally like wasn't planned, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so we spent a lot of time designing and refining um, and prototyping um, all of the models. And then there just comes a point in the summer where we just have to press go and you know send the files mm -hmm. off, the final files to be cut in, in steel. Um, mm -hmm. We just heard a really good quote. Uh, Abraham Lincoln said this, that if you give me six hours to- Six months. Oh, no, no. Six weeks. No, six hours to, to chop down a tree, I will spend five of those hours sharpening my ax. And so that's kind of true for us is that we will spend as much time as possible prototyping and developing the CAD files and, you know, almost like at the 11th hour, we will just hit publish basically and like, and, and then it goes. Uh, we work with a super awesome metal shop that is excited about, um, you know, not just making stainless steel sinks. Um, but also are excited about producing some art with us. The guy is super great. It's up for stainless enrichment if anyone ever wants to go hang out with them. Um, and yeah, it, it takes a village also. Like um, our community and our friends are so awesome at coming out to help build with us because we literally can't do it just the two of us, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, all of the support that we get from the community is, is super important. Yeah, I, I love that when you hear um, from someone uh, you know more specifically about the factories that they're using to make some of these things and like it's not always as straight a path as you might think you know like um it, you, as you said it's someone who's saying things and you know i had a project and i was looking for antennas and it ended up being a person that made spoons as well and it's like it's bizarre how you end up finding these partners um what did yeah. what was how how did you find uh the the laser cutting shop that, that you eventually landed on is there like blogs or resources that, that you rely on? Or? So the, the first time, we just sort of cold called a bunch of places, uh, you know, basically just Google searching and whatnot. But as we've sort of gone on and, and sort of uh, infused, infused ourselves to the Burning Man community, we've met so many other artists who have been really generous in sharing their, their contacts information. So we actually now use a place that we had never even heard of before. but. One of our, our great friends, Ryan Fredericks, who's a, another Burning Man sculptor, he mm -hmm. gave us the contact for this. And then I've gone and actually shared the same contact with a bunch of other artists. So um, it's this really great sort of community of, of sculptors that share spaces, they do events together, and are super open to, to um, giving advice on fabricators, materials, et cetera. Cool, cool. Um, so, so Burning Man, you mentioned this is, like this is the ideal place to to showcase work like this. Um, well, our work especially, I think we sort of have this feeling behind our work that there are most artifacts from potentially another civilization, and because a Burning Man appears like a, a planet, like a you know, like it's, the moon a, or it's almost as they they fell from space and landed there, right? The one we're doing now is the Heart of Gold, which actually resembles a spaceship, you know. So it's sort of like it just kind of. <laughs> landed on at on Playa, and these other pieces just sort of landed there. And at any moment, they could fly up and go back into space. That's so, so for for our type of work, it's especially um, you know uh, appropriate. Um, and also, like the way that the lighting changes, just like from moment to moment, it's just it's so beautiful out there, and you just can't get that kind of light and have like a week to photograph your art and have so many amazing photo uh, photographers at Burning Man like go there just to photograph. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it's a really creative place. There's a lot of creativity that actually happens on the playa, which I don't think many people think of when they mm -hmm. think of Burning Man. Yeah, we get access to photographers that we would never have access to otherwise, you know, that come yeah. from around the world. I mean, we're, it's also a little obsessive as a, as a creator. I would go out, one of us would go out like every day at like 7 p.m. as the sun was setting, just so we didn't miss that amazing photo. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> And so, what's what is um, what does your schedule look like? You guys all arrive at Burning Man, and what's how big is your team, and how long does it take to to um, assemble one of these? So we're gonna have about um, fifteen people come out early with us this year, um, and we get there, I guess, like five days early. So it's like fifteen people, like 
you know, 10 to 12 hour days. Um, and uh, so it's, it's quite a bit of work, um, but it's also pretty fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's exciting to be out there uh, earlier when, all, when the only people who are there are either artists or people who are building as well. And so it's, it's a nice group of people to be around. So that's pretty fun. Yeah, and we do test builds, you know, in our warehouse. So mm-hmm. it's not the first time we're putting these together. So we try to troubleshoot anything before. And so once we get there, it's basically just trying to dealing with the heat, the wind, the dust. Right. And, and so, of course, the different elements um, uh, of, of, uh, of construction. What are your What are some of your favorite tools that you use to to prototype, to test, to to model? L- well, let's talk about the prototyping tools. Then we have some funny stories about construction <laughs> tools that we'll go Ooh. into. Uh, for prototyping, we obviously love the laser cutter. Uh, we have ac- we have access to like three different laser cutters of different sizes depending on the need. That's extremely important. Three uh, D printing is highly useful for us. We actually. To, to assemble things together, for instance, this prototype here is every single one of these panels is laser cut, and then in between where they're connected is there's a little 3D print and little snaps. So basically it goes together almost like Lego, um, no glue or anything, and you can assemble it really quickly. So I think laser cutting and 3D printing are, are kind of our go-to things, and then um, when we actually construct and prototype and build the sculptures themselves, there's some other tools that you can go into. So I think that um, as a artist and a creator and a builder, you always have to get like a little scrappy. And so we've had some pretty funny occasions where we've had to use something that we like didn't expect to use. And so now we've just kind of um, immortalized it, and now we have like nominations for like unexpected tool of the year. Um, so like the first year it was a butter knife. The second year it was like a huge two by four that was just in our warehouse. Like we don't even know where it came from, but it actually like became so important in our build that we like spray painted it gold so that like everyone knew that it was ours and no one would ever take it. We shipped, we shipped, Dubai. Else. We shipped a 10 foot two by four all the way to Dubai <laughs> because we needed it to, to build, to push up. You know, as you build these sculptures, some of them start sagging a little bit. Yep. You know? and, and to get it back into position, you have to basically be on the ground and use a two by four. A nail clipper was very important. Yeah, nail clippers um, are very important. We use a lot of zip ties and then very small zip ties to connect some of the electrical, and you can just snip them really quickly with nail clippers. Uh-huh. So we, we basically don't leave home without those. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then Elena is, a, is the drill master. Yeah. I was uh, like had to use the drill so much last year that I actually had to wear like a wrist guard <laughs> because it was like a uh, like workplace injury. <laughs> um, I I came across this um, this medium post, Elena, that you had written um, about um, intellectual property, actually, um, and it was. Um, it, it was it was like you know something that a lot of artists who are sharing their work um, in such a public way obviously have to deal with. Um, I, I just was curious, you know, if you could talk a little bit more about this and maybe about how this changes the way you approach either you know new work or new campaigns. Yeah. So I mean, I think the first like piece of advice that I would give artists just is that like it's. If you're doing something good, someone will probably try to copy you, and you should almost take that as some as you know a compliment. But at the same time, like the legal system exists to protect uh, unique and copyrighted work, and so like the law is really on your side. Um, and so I think that the process that you should go through basically is determining whether it's like worth it for you to to fight about it um and i think that um it was a very like empowering process to say that like we actually you know did create something original um and that that's like incredibly empowering to be able to bring something into reality you know um and so i think the the most important thing is to is to understand that you know, you want to put your work out into the public eye because that's how people will appreciate you and connect with you. And you should never let anything stop you from doing that. And that um, can basically include, you know, um, 
basically, you know, people, you know, thinking that your stuff is so cool that they want to use it too. Um, and the best advice I have to producers and to, you know, other creatives um, is to just contact the artist directly rather than trying to, um, you know, create similar work. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, I think that's great advice. Um, another another thing that I would love to um, to ask you about is, you know, as a three time um, creator at this point. Um, you know, we get asked this question a lot um, on our community forum campus, um, which is basically, what do you know now that you wish you had known then? So what what sort of, um, what have you picked up since you ran that first project and, and you're, it's, you're sort of carrying through as a strategy now for these, um, these two more recent campaigns? Oh, so much, so much. I think the main thing for us has been like the development of um, really great like media, like really great pictures and really great um, like images of rewards and making sure that it's like super clear what people are kind of interested in and getting into. Um, and then like being able to like iterate and respond off of that. If some, if people are like, wow, this is so cool and are sharing like a particular picture of a reward, like to emphasize that I think is really important. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that having really good renderings is also super, super important because um, people really want to see and be interested in and be wowed by it. Um, and I think the best thing that we've done is just to try to build a super strong community around it. Like we we have this like year round that we, you know, try to connect with people. We put up art. We, um, you know, see what people are interested in. We like talk to other artists. We talk to our fans and stuff like that. And so I think that developing a community that is strong and will support you is probably the most important thing and also the kind of the best part of this project too. Yeah. After that first campaign when you were sort of transitioning um, this community had created through the Kickstarter campaign and um, made that decision to continue making this work. Um, correct me if I have the chronology wrong there. Um, but how did you how did you initially make that transition um, to keep that momentum going so this was uh, a sustainable thing? Well, so actually, it was um, it was like the external stimulus. So uh, after the campaign ended, we got a couple of emails asking if there if they could people could still get some of our rewards. Mm. And so we were like, oh, <laughs> like people, ten, people, uh, once the t once like the tenth person asked us because uh, they maybe only saw our project at Burning Man for the first time, and they looked us up and they're like, oh, you guys had a Kickstarter. I could have got one of these. And once like the tenth person asked us, Gillian and I. We're said like, okay, let's let's set up a quick online shop and like make some extra rewards and try to sell them. Yeah, and then and then that sort of became a strategy in your next campaign where you were like, all right, we'll do the installation, and also people can take home a smaller version of the installation. Or yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry, I'm just trying to fix the light. Um, yeah, so yeah, so exactly. Um, we started to try to make you know the rewards and the. Um, the products that we make like as cool as possible and we focused a lot on that and then out of that we were like well let's make like the biggest coolest sculpture that we could um in an effort to you know then have a bunch of rewards that kind of spin off of that like we spent like months and months last year developing this really unique and really like ground pattern that was grounded in like science and um material science and that pattern then has like transformed and given us like so many ways to like get it out into the world and ways to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think like we put a lot of work into the sculpture and then it kind of spins off into these products. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, it's a pretty unique model that we've sort of developed kind of not even intentionally that eventually like we, we, we try to share that with other artists, you know, because I think there's a sort of stigma with like selling, you know, what could be perceived as souvenirs almost. Uh, but we love like this, the relationship between doing like a wild sculpture, investing everything into it, and then seeing how that can trickle down into, you know, things for your home. Because to be honest, no, people don't have space for our sculptures, nor budget for our sculptures, but we don't want to prevent them from attaining some of our, our work and our passion. Yeah. And I think also like there, there's a lot of pressure in like, buying a piece of artwork and i think that it's perceived as something that like not a lot of people have access to but 
um, I think that buying a light is something that people like, you know, can wrap their heads around. And I think that like, we just sneakily like snuck in like buying art, you know, as, as, a, as um, you know, kind of a guise basically <laughs> in, in buying a light. How are you? How are you shipping these things when you're when you're doing the, the one-offs? Do they do they come sort of in a flat pack way? Yeah. So yeah. So now we the first time we sent them all assembled, which was like crazy um, and not like that's actually something that we definitely learned is that like flat packing for packaging is super super great. Um, yeah. So the first time we sent them assembled and like really actually we sent them all over the world and the only one that broke was the one that was sent to. Berkeley, which is like three miles away, which is kind of funny. It looks like someone sat on the box, uh, but we got to meet those people because we just went and hand delivered them a replacement. Um, now we're friends. Um, yeah, so that was. For, what do you use for shipping? Um, so we um, use this uh, service called ShipStation. Um, it's, it's super, super helpful and useful. Um, I hope that you guys have a native integration soon. But for right now, it's just in spreadsheets. Oh, but we've learned, actually, that's a good, back to an earlier question. We've yeah. learned so much over the last three years about shipping and fulfillment. Um, once, you know, as soon as we got our own uh, printer and our own label printer, and our friend told us about ShipStation, and what used to be such a pain point and a week-long headache for us has now turned into like a couple hours of work. Yeah, it's you, have remarkable. A, you have a little thermal printer. Yeah, yeah, amazing, that never runs out of ink. Yeah. And then we just take basically just pack as many boxes as together, and we just drive to the post office, and we actually go to the back entrance where the loading dock is, and we just drop a box off and say, you know, wave goodbye, and totally. it shows up. And um, the, the insurance policies of ShipStation are really good, which has been very important to us, because you know things get lost in the mail. Cool. You kind of want to be yeah. covered. That's what I've done as well. Um, we do have an integration with Indicia and with um, stamps.com where you can export your backer report. And so it oh. formats it for those services. Um, okay. Perhaps more to come in the future. Um, I'll check it out. But yeah, thermal, thermal printers are like the, the most amazing thing. Have you, have, have, you, um, have you seen those? I think Uline makes a crazy uh, tape dispenser too. It's like a big desktop one. Uh -huh. uh, they're really fun to check out. Too. Uh, cool. Yeah, the first the first year, I think we wrote all the addresses by hand on all the envelopes. Um, but yeah, sometimes people hand. they ask us like, how do you, like what do you use to do your shipping? And we're like, we do it ourselves. And like they like can't believe that because everyone kind of just wants to like you know have someone else do it. And we're like, well, we like to put the personal touch on things. You know, like like uh, spray paint our patterns on the box and stuff like that. And it's just, it's just, it's kind of worth it for us to be able to write a little note and everything like that to our supporters. And it was actually fun writing the names by hand. You actually remember the names. So when you'd meet someone later, they'd tell you their name and you'd totally know, you know, because I, you know, we hand wrote and we also knew where they lived, <laughs> what street they were on. <laughs> um, so for anyone that's uh, going to be at Burning Man, um, what, any any special information of where they can find you, uh, what they should be excited about? Yeah, so we're super, super excited about the lighting um, for the sculpture this year. And so definitely come by at night. I mean, it'll be amazing during the day too, but definitely um, check it out at night. And um, we usually try to put ourselves um, a little away from the actual city, usually by the temple, which is um, one of the for this out points that you could be um, within the within within the within the city and uh, part of the adventure is uh, finding us so um, we won't tell you exactly what oh, it will be. One thing that will be fun uh, I think we're because we're using mirror and glass we're gonna have a, a little challenge dealing with some of the dust and whatnot so I think we're gonna have a little container a little bin off the side with some microfiber cloths <laughs> so if anyone comes and feels like they want to get you know a little, uh, do a little cleaning. They can come and sort of wipe down the sculptures a little bit. Um, we would not oppose to that. So, and that could be your participation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, any backers out there on the current project, if they want to come and be part of the cleanup crew, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, well, thank you both so much for for joining us. This has been awesome. Um, definitely um, check out the because of those, uh, third and newest campaign, which is live right now, that you can go on and back. Um, and yeah, we look forward to, um, to staying in touch with you guys in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much. We, we 
Kickstarter has completely changed our lives. It's <laughs> been such a thrilling process. Thank you for creating this platform. It means like the world to us. It really does. Awesome. You're welcome. All right. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Okay.